Okay. Welcome, everyone. Now that it's um, 1 p.m., we'll just get started for the sake of time. Today, we're talking about how to use Blackboard for remote teaching. I'm your host, Catalin Wargo, um, Cat, I go by Cat, and um, I'm with the Studio for Teaching and Learning Innovation. We also have Mike Bloom here with us, and um, we have Christy Walker, who will be manning the chat window. So you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat option. So if you have any questions during the session, I recommend that you type those questions in the chat window and then um, Christy will try to field as many of those as she can in the time that's given. Um, at the end of our session in uh, 30 minutes, we will also have a question and answer session where we will be able to hopefully answer some of your questions about Blackboard. So this is going to be a really basic rundown of um, Blackboard, and um, one second, my screen is not working. Here we go. Okay. So um, for those of you who have not used Blackboard before, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what the benefits of using Blackboard are. So using Blackboard can be really helpful to you and your students. It's um, a course management system that allows you to provide content to your students in a central location, um, communicate with your students really quickly, provide grades in an electronic format to students. Students can also submit assignments electronically and work with a variety of built-in web-based tools. And students can also access their peers' um, assignments if you provide that to them for peer assessment, um, you know, if projects are designed for peer assessment. So there's a, a lot of really great reasons to be using Blackboard for remote teaching. It's a really great place to provide all of the course um, materials for students. So today we're really just breaking it down, um, you know, from, from the very start, we're gonna talk about how to generate a Blackboard course, how to edit the course availability, um, how to customize your course menu, how to create assignments, how to create tests and quizzes and deploy them. And as much as possible, I'm actually gonna go into Blackboard and try to show you some of these things. So just bear with me as I try clicking through, um, you know, my options in my, in my um, windows here. Excuse me while I move some Zoom things out of the way there. They're in my way. Okay. All right, so the first thing we wanna talk about is the Blackboard course generator. And um, the course generator allows you to create your own courses within the Blackboard learning management system where you can share course content with students in a secure online environment. So through using the generator, you'll be able to um, create new blank courses using the default course shell. Um, you'll be able to combine sections into one course, and you'll be able to copy any existing courses that you may have created from previous semesters. All right, so for creating a course, what you'll want to do is you'll want to log into your Blackboard um, through your My William and Mary portal and choose Blackboard. I've already logged in here. Um, after logging into Blackboard, you're going to go to the institution page that's on the left-hand side here. And then in the faculty staff links here, you'll go to the Blackboard course generator. And so you'll see that there's a, a long, long list of names of William and Mary faculty. Um, I'm gonna go down here to my husband's name. I have to scroll really far because his name is Wargo. Sorry. All right. So there we go. Once I click, once I um, select his name, I can go and I can view 
his courses. Now you won't be able to view other people's courses. You'll just see your courses, but you can see all of these courses listed here, right? So for spring 2020, he's got some um, courses that he can create. So what I would do is I would simply click on the course that I wanted to create. <clears throat> And then I would click down here on create blackboard course you see at the bottom of the screen. <clears throat> My zoom window is a little bit in the way here. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to create that course right now because he might get mad at me. But just so you know, um, that option would be there for you. And if you wanted, you could change the course name. And if you wanted to use a previous course that you had used before um, for Blackboard, you would be provided a drop down menu and you could use another course as a template for your new course. And then you would just hit confirm. However, once again, I'm not going to do that. Um, when you create a course with multiple sections, you would follow the same process um, as, as the one we just followed, except in step two, you would click on the checkbox in front of each of the courses that you wanted um, to create. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about course availability. So courses will be available to you and your students within three hours. Um, it's not usually, it's not available immediately. So you'll just have to know that once you go through the Blackboard generator, you'll need to wait just a little bit for your course availability. Enrollment is tied to the banner system. So when a student's enrollment changes in the banner system, it will also populate those changes to your Blackboard course. The enrollment process is not immediate and it can take up to a couple of hours before new students are populated. So just be aware of that. And then for non-William & Mary user accounts, um, those are created daily between six, um, at 6.45 a.m. and 6.45 p.m. And when a course is created, the availability is set to yes. So students will be able to access your course content as soon as they are enrolled through the banner system. So you just wanna be aware that as soon as you create that course, it is available to students. So if you do not want it to be available to students, you will wanna make sure that you set the availability to private. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. As a best practice, if you're still modifying any of your course content, we recommend that you hide content areas from students um, while you update because then it eliminates any confusion that students may have based on you know things that you've changed um, so it allows you to update certain things and make those items available like say the syllabus or a weekly agenda or what have you while you're still able to update other things so once you're ready for students to see the content area you can show that link to students I'm going, to, I'm going to just show you how to edit that course availability. So I'm going to go to my courses here. You can see on the left hand side of my Blackboard menu, I can click into my courses. And um, I'm just going to go to this one. You can see here if I click on the little three dots on this course, I can make my course private. And then Blackboard um, is great because it allows you to um, change your decision. If that's not the course you wanted to make private, then it allows you to change it. So, um, but I actually want to make this one private. And you can see here that there's an icon that tells you that now it's locked and students won't be able to see it. You will still be able to get in and make changes to your course. It's just that students can't see it. Now, if you want students to be able to see certain sections of your course, I recommend actually opening the course up so I'm going to open it to students. And then when I go into the course, you can see here that there's a little chevron next to each course item. And if I go to topic one, I can hide individual topics. And so you can see this little box here. It indicates that that topic is hidden, right? So I can hide as many topics or content areas as I like, right? You'll just want to know that if you want students to be able to see it, you got to go back into that Chevron and you have to click show link. Okay. So that's course availability. Let's talk a little bit about course navigation. 
So one of the things that you'll want to do once you get your course um, generated and once you're able to view it and you've dealt with the availability issues is you'll want to customize the course menu. And so um, I'm going to take you through that process now, but basically Blackboard's course menu provides you access to um, certain content. So um, the menu items and the order in which they appear are fully customizable and can be arranged based upon your preferences. Um, and all of that takes place within the course menu here. You'll see these little buttons that exist right at the top of the course menu and we'll walk through what some of those mean. Okay. Oh, one quick one quick um, point is that you can only edit your course menu if the edit mode is on. So just make sure that you've toggled that edit mode on when you are trying to edit your course menu. Otherwise, you won't be able to make changes. And I've made that mistake before where I've tried to make changes in my course and I'm clicking on things and it's not working. So just make sure that that little button is on. So here we see edit mode is on. And if you look here at the plus um, symbol, you can add a content area, you can add a module page, a blank page, a tool link, a course link, okay? These are all things that you can add. <clears throat> so if I wanted to add um, a content area, I could call it syllabus. I would put it in here and it would appear there, right? And then when I click on syllabus, I can add my syllabus to that section, right? So if I go back to um, my menu here, if I want to move things around, you'll see that there is a little um, arrow where you can move certain things if you want to. You just move them up and down into the place that you want to. You'll also notice that we've got dividers here. If you go up here, you can um, create a subdivider or a subheader. You can create a divider. So you see we've got the subheader here, welcome. Um, we've got dividers kind of dividing up um, just basic overall um, information for the course and then um, our course content where we have specific um, topics for maybe each week, right? And then we've divided that from course tools. So it's really good to use those dividers to kind of chunk the information so students um, don't get overwhelmed with everything on that side menu. Um, so we've shown you the drag and drop reordering. Um, there's also this action bar here where you can reorder menu items. So if I wanted to put, um, you know, about the course somewhere else, I could, I could move it by just clicking on it and then clicking on the arrow and hitting submit. Okay, so that's your course menu. We really recommend a modular approach to the course menu and to organizing the course menu to make it kind of like a, you know, a map for your students accessing all of the content and information in Blackboard. Um, so the modular approach really makes navigating course materials and course documents for any module, which is loosely defined as any week or unit or class session, more intuitive for students. Um, we also recommend incorporating outlines for each module that provide an introduction and an in-depth explanation of all of the instructional activities that students will be expected to complete for that module. So you'll see in this example that the instructor has included modules that are just, you know, weeks 
draft. So the content is broken up by each week. You could break it up by, you know, topics, depending on your course. Um, you could also break it up by, um, you know, specific units that you have. It's really up to you, but it just helps students to be able to know um, that for that week or that given module, that's the folder that they're going to go in. And you'll also see in this um, agenda that's provided, there's a welcome to the week. Um, there's a reminder for, you know, each online week, these are the things one, two, three that we will be doing, right? That's helpful for students to know. Um, there's an overview of what's going to be covered. There's a list of the learning objectives for that particular week. And then this instructor has provided the due dates for the week. So that allows students to really understand once they go into that week, um, everything that's expected of them. And you probably already do this in your face-to-face -face courses, um, you know, in class. But, you know, once we go to remote, you, you won't necessarily have that opportunity to be able to tell them in person um, what needs to be done. So this provides a really good opportunity to do that. Um, another way to ensure students know what to do is to include some sort of module agenda that delineates what activities students should complete. So for instance, this example is organized by, um, you can see read here, uh, view lectures, participate, and then submit is down at the bottom. Um, so depending on, you know, what kinds of activities you'll have students doing, you could provide headers like that so students would know what they're expected to read, what lectures you expect them to watch, or what activities you expect them to do. It's really helpful for them to have that outline. We also recommend numbering module items within modules to indicate the order that activities should be completed. Um, including an explanation regarding the materials and how students should be using them to guide their learning. Um, <clears throat> so you'll see in this example that this instructor has said, you know, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. So it's week one and it's activity one that's here, you know. So these students know they're going to have a Kahoot quiz on their peers, and then they're gonna read the national interest overview, and then they'll be watching the national interest videos. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, collecting assignments and, and creating assignments. So the easiest way to collect assignments or papers or files from your students is to create an assignment in Blackboard. And with assignments, you can create coursework and manage the grades and feedback for each student separately, which is really handy. Um, so you can create assignments in content areas, learning modules, lesson plans, and folders. So if I go to my course and I go into one of the module areas and I go to my assessments, I can create an assignment. And you see this window pops up here. So you would um, title the assignment. You can type the assignment in here in this box, or you can browse my computer to find an assignment that you've already created in your, um, on your laptop or on your computer. You can also browse the content collection if you've already created assignments that are in your um, Blackboard content collection already. Um, you would set your due dates here. And then you would set your points. Maybe it's 100 points. You have the option to add a rubric. Rubrics are really handy for letting students know what the success criteria is for the assignment. And it can also speed up your assessment process because you can create rubrics here in Blackboard where you're able to, um, you know, just select certain indicators for success. So that can be um, an efficiency for you as, a, um, as an instructor. Um, if you don't want to make the assignment immediately available, 
You can limit the availability, say you wanted to um, make it available at a later date. I, however, think it's really good just to make the assignment, um, in, instead of saying, you know, display after a certain time, um, I, I would say, you know, just, just hide it from students from the onset and then you can unhide it. And then you would hit submit right here down at the bottom. Um, so that's, that's assignments. Let's think a little bit about different kinds of assessments. So the assessment cycle in Blackboard is um, you create a test or a quiz, then you deploy it, then students submit their work, then you can grade it, then you post grades, and then students can view their grades. So today we'll be talking about creating a test and deploying a test. Um, so you can use tests and quizzes to measure student knowledge, to gauge progress, and to gather information from your students. Um, this video that I'm going to show you is from Blackboard, and um, it, it takes us through the process of how we add questions and um, make the test available to students. Um, one thing that I would recommend to you is anytime you have a question about doing anything on Blackboard, Blackboard has their own instructor help for students. So if you Google Blackboard in, or Blackboard instructor help, <laughs> not for students, um, if you Google Blackboard instructor help, you'll be able to find their website from Blackboard um, and they will walk you through all of these different processes. So that's where I got this um, video. I'm going to take my headphones out right now so I can show you the video. You can create tests to gauge progress and measure student knowledge. Let's take a look. To begin, select course tools from the control panel and then select tests, surveys, and pools. Next, select tests and then select build test. Give the test the name and optional description and instructions and when you are finished, select submit. You can add questions in the test page. Here, you can create new questions by selecting a question type or by uploading questions from your computer. You also have the option to reuse existing questions from other tests. When you are finished adding questions to the test, select OK. If you create a test, the next step is to deploy it. First, navigate to the location where you want to test. Next, select assessments to access the menu, and then select test. Select the test you want to add, and then select submit. Make the test available to students and choose whether or not to create an announcement for the test. Optionally, set options for multiple attempts, course completion, and the timer. Next, set the display dates and due date and select options for feedback and presentation. When you are finished, select submit. Students can now access the test and the system automatically generates a grade center column for the test. Okay, so um, once you've created a test, they they showed you how to deploy, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna show you um, here. Um, So if I go to my, one of my content areas and say I wanted to add a quiz in this section here, I would go up to assessments and I would click on test and then I would click on the test that I created and I would hit submit. And then I have um, all of my test options that I can go through. I can change those test options if I would like to. And then I hit submit. And you'll notice 
that the test that I've created appears at the bottom of my content area. So I can drag that up to wherever I want it to be. And I can um, make it um, available or unavailable. So if I want to make it available here, I can make it available. Um, I can edit the test options. I can I can edit the test, I can edit the test options. So the difference between editing the test and the test options is that when you're editing the test, you're actually editing the questions and the um, activities that students are doing within the test. And when you're editing the test options, that's all about when students take the test, how long they have to take the test, um, you know, when is it going to be released and so forth. So just so you know, those are the differences. Okay, so now we've come to the point in our session where um, we will take questions. I see that the chat window has been um, very active. I'm going to put my headphones back in here so I can hear you better. Okay, what questions do we have? What uh, sort of content can you have on a quiz or a test? Is there anything other than them writing text? Is there options for them submitting diagrams, say, or for there to be a diagram that they see and respond to in writing? Um, yes, definitely. You have those options. Um, it's um, there. There are a lot of options for the test items. Um, you know, multiple choice fill in the blank, um, you know, short, an short answer, um, you know, matching. Uh, there are options for students to respond to, um, you know, different diagrams and so forth. I think um, individuals in the past have provided a diagram and then, you know, say had, um, you know, A, B, C, or D marked on the diagram so that students could choose individual answers. Um, Mike or Christy, do you have anything to add to that? Um, well, specifically what? Like, uh, according to... What the, kinds of uh, options do students the, or do instructors have for, say, students being able to, like, diagram on a Blackboard test? Right. Um, so there are, there are also hotspots that you can choose. if. Um, if you wanted students to be able to identify areas, um, you can also embed your own uh, images and videos so that you can have them actually maybe respond in text. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to have them diagram um, on the Blackboard site itself. What, what you might think about doing is having them do the diagrams on a piece of paper and taking a photo of that piece of paper and then having a, a, a file upload option in that Blackboard test. Um, and then you could either grade it manually or I, I know that there's some people messing with grade scope, but you know, I wouldn't want to get you involved in that if that's nothing that you have to do. Yeah, and um, some of my online instructors are definitely using that um, process of having students, you know, diagram out physiological processes or what have you and then um, taking a picture of it and uploading it. So I'm not sure what kind of course do you teach? Yeah, biology. So that would be the sort of thing I'd want. I just didn't know what the functionality was for, for having, uh, for me to put, to upload things or for them to upload things. So it's pretty easy. It's, it's there. Yeah. 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 I mean, you can, you can continue and you can actually, you know, send them a PDF that they can print out. Although, you know, that's, that's also a little bit dangerous because we don't know if they're going to have access to printers. So if you wanted to maybe give them a prompt that they could then write out on a sheet of paper and then take a picture of that and upload it, it might be better. Okay. Uh, Matt, uh, it's Pablo. Um, there, you know, Mike mentioned Gradescope. There was a really cool little tool that we could, I could send you along also that um, with using their cell phone, they can put together multi-page uh, PDFs that they could submit as part of an assessment in Blackboard as well. It kind of rectifies the, the image 
of what they're say, sending so that if it's not quite straight, it kind of straightens it up and cleans it up a little bit. That might be a useful tool for your students to have. So somebody's asking for a brief tutorial of Penopto. There's actually one coming up at three o'clock. So if you'd like to sign up for that one, um, the webinar, you, you can sign up for that. Uh, there will also be um, tutorial help, as a matter of fact, on our website, um, keepteaching.wm.edu. You can find our tutorials, and we have, we have one fully built out for Zoom, almost fully built out for Zoom, and we're working on one right now for Panopto with some of the basic questions, how to pre provision your Panopto course for Blackboard and all that. So make sure that you keep um, looking back at that keepteaching.wm.edu website and uh, most of the information is going to be there. Okay. Um, Caitlin, I have a question regarding um, diagrams and, and, and figures on tests. So do we just cut and paste them into the Blackboard as we are building the test? Yeah, you can include images that you're able to embed into the test. That's correct. And that's just do it through cut and paste. Or they also talked about in the video that you can kind of upload a test that's already on your um, computer. Does that have to be in Word or PDF in order to do that feature? Um, yes, you can upload a test that's already created. I'm not sure if it has to be in um, a specific format of Word or PDF. Mike, do you know if there's a limit on that? No, I don't think that that's a problem. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I, think, I think you should be able to. And if, if it requires a PDF, then you can always convert that Word document to a PDF pretty easily. And okay. so there's a question from Jenny Ron about the ability for students to, to, for a faculty member to see what the test looks like from the student perspective. You can actually take the test and that's not a problem. So once you've created the test, you can go in and, and you can take it as if you were a student. It just won't submit that into the grade center for you. Got it. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Hi, this is Matt Mavrzik. I, I had my hand raised on the hand raised thing, so I'll jump in. Okay. Um, my question is specifically regarding uh, having students handing in assignments. I've had some difficulties trying to find the best way of do the, doing this. I've played around with things. It seems like maybe journal is the best way of doing it, but it's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not sure the best, the best way. If you could actually walk through a little bit more or talk about that. Yeah, so um, Matt, we would need to know a little bit about the context of your course um, to determine what might be the best, um, you know, assignment kind of um, opportunity for your students. So this course is a upper level seminar with 14 students and they are submitting summaries a couple times a week of research articles. And so I would like to be able to have them upload those Word files, uh, me being able to track changes, giving comments, and then return them. You just want an assignment, Matt. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just a basic Blackboard assignment, and you'd create those. And we have instructions on how to, how to do that, but it's, it's a basic assignment. They'll upload their uh, document to the assignment. You can grade it right there if you want in line, or you can download them and do it on your, um, on your computer and then upload them right to the assignment back to the students. You don't have to bother with emailing or anything like that. Okay. And this is private for each student. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's a Blackboard assignment is what you want. Okay. I will go to that function. I didn't find that before. Uh, so. Excellent. Okay. Can I ask a quick question too? This is, uh, this is Paul uh, Mana from government. Hi Paul. Yeah, hi, thanks, Kat. So um, I've, when I've talked to people about when they have created tests in Blackboard, um, you know, using the, the multiple choice or short answer or whatever short answer uh, within Blackboard, everyone has told me um, there, it's a little clunkier. There's a bit of a steep, you know, you know, curve to get started, but then, you know, once you get the hang of it, it's, it's okay. I guess, could you maybe flag for us where should we expect to be a little frustrated? You know, what, where, is, where are the bottlenecks as we're trying to learn this, just so we kind of know what's, what's ahead if we, if we try this and we're new to it? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll start and then I'll, I'll let people add um, if they want to. Um, I think, you know, one of the issues sometimes with Blackboard is just the immense amount of clicking that is required. And so when you're creating a test, there are a lot of options for you, you know, um, which is good in that you have some flexibility with the different kinds of questions that you can provide to students. However, um, you know, if you're creating questions individually and you're like, okay, yes, multiple choice. Now I'm going to add the question. Now I'm going to add all of the options. Yes, I want it to be random um, ordering or, you know, what have you. It, it can be a little tedious to create um, you know, say a 50 question test that way. Um, one way that I would say you can mitigate that is by using the feature where you're able to upload a test that's already created. Presumably, you've already ha you already have some um, assessments that you've created. And so I think that that speeds up the process a little bit. Um, so does, Mike, and Mike, could, could I just follow up on that too? So <laughs> say upload a test, that doesn't mean it automatically populates into the Blackboard system, right? I mean, in that- Oh, yes it, yes, it does. What you would oh, do- Oh, it does. Is, oh, oh, What okay. you would do is you would format a text um, file. Okay. And, and we can send you instructions on this. It's not that hard. So if you have a basic text editor, um, you basically, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a system that you have. So if you wanted a multiple choice question, you know, you'd put MC, then you'd hit tab, then you'd write the question out, and then you'd have which is the correct answer would come first. So it's a process. And what you would do is you would actually create not the test itself, but the questions. And then you'd create a test, and then you'd be able to upload all of those questions in a text file um, so that you don't have to do that repetitive motion of each question at a time. So and it's just easier for some people. For some people, they like the repetitive nature of, you know, I know that I click here, a question is created, there's not going to be a problem. But if you like dealing with spreadsheets and text files, this is actually easier. Okay. And is that already on one of those Blackboard tutorials, you think? Um, it's definitely somewhere there, but I don't know if it's going to be easy to find. It's not on, the, it's not on our Blackboard tutorial site, but um, Blackboard has it on their help page. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if you go to help.blackboard.com, um, you should be able to search uh, create a mm -hmm. test and that'll be one of the options in there. Look for okay. questions as a test feature. Yeah, and I, I think they've created a tutorial for you for that. So and that's um, actually a great tutorial. I, I went through that one and Blackboard did a nice job on that one. Um, I used to, I did my own tutorial years ago because Blackboard didn't have anything and I went back and I saw that they did a much better job now. I'm sure yours is still really good though, Mike. <laughs> it's out of date. And it's a little out of date, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Other questions? I just posted the link in the oh, chat great. so you can access it. Thanks, Christy. Thanks, Christy. Christy, it looks like you're in Hawaii. I came to visit you. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Okay, well, um, I encourage you all to definitely go through the Keep Teaching website for further tutorials. We're adding to those, um, you know, every hour, it seems. <laughs> um, if you have any questions, you can um, email us um, at, is it, is it steely.wm.edu, Mike? Sure, you can do STLI uh, at wm.edu, or you can even just email keep teaching at wm.edu. Yeah, yeah. I recommend emailing keep teaching because that, that might um, get sent out um, more immediately because we're- It will, because we're really yeah. focusing on getting those- well, Could you say that again? Team teaching? Keep, keep, keep teaching. teaching. Keep teaching at wm.edu for Just any, teaching. yes, yeah, for any individual questions that you might have. And I'll type it up here. Thanks, you put it in the chat. I am. Oh, keep teaching, okay. Yes, keep teaching. Keep yes. teaching. Okay. okay. Yes, I thank you all for your um, hard work and your flexibility in this time. I know that, um, it can be a little, a little frightening, but we're here for you, and we really appreciate all the work that you're putting into providing great experiences for our students, so thank you.
Kat, can I can I ask one last question? I, I think you maybe addressed it, but the the connection of Panopto to Blackboard that is that going to be covered in the Panopto webinar later today? Paul, yes. I'll, I'll I'll take that. I we are definitely covering that. That's a good chunk of what we're covering. Um, and uh, we'll you know join us at three if you're interested in in doing that. Okay, and thanks. Paul, there's also, that's one of the tutorials that's already available on our Keep Teaching website. If you go to the Panopto section of that, you'll find that exact tutorial there if you want to watch that before the three o'clock. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, just since we have a little bit of a semi-captive audience right now, uh, did anybody have audio issues during this session? I know that my audio when, um, when Kat was playing the video was a little, a little jagged. Um, was audio okay for everybody? No, it was. Just no, the, 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 the um, video part was pretty bad when she was yeah. playing the video. Yeah. yeah. Oh, was it? Yeah. I'll have to keep that in mind for my session. Uh, yeah, guys, Kat, you just need to yell at me. Kat, yeah. <laughs> There's nothing that you can do about it at that point. I think that you actually have to mute yourself and, and set it so that it's capturing the... Um, the machine audio at that point, if you really, because now it's just capturing it through the speakers. So that's always uh, problematic if you're uh, it without that. So that's okay. I'm, gonna get, Many, I'm, gonna get, I'm gonna get going, but I just wanted to let you know that you have one person with their hand up. So um, maybe you want to take that question. Okay, ask, ask away. Is that? Oh, Pei Young Yang. Well, we unmute her. I can't do it. Anyone who? Oh, sorry. Uh, I just, yeah, hi, this is Pei Yu. Hello? Yeah, we can hear, oh, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I just have a quick question on the assessment. Can you guide me through how to use the survey, how to create a survey or a poll on Blackboard? Yeah, so it's, it's going to be um, that pretty much that same process that that video walks through and Christy provided a um, link to the blackboard help page mm -hmm. where you will be able to find um, specific instructions for creating a test and creating a survey that will walk you through um, all of the steps that you need to take as well as tutorials for that right okay thank you okay and beware when you're creating a survey that um you will make those anonymous and you won't be able to access any um mike kind of cut out but i think what he was saying is that if you make if you're making a survey and it's anonymous you won't be able to you won't be able to know you know which students responded to you know what right because it's anonymous so just beware of that so do you recommend um make a survey in blackboard or actually using the google form well it really depends on what you're trying to do with it what is what might be a sample um you know survey that you're thinking about using i'm thinking about asking students like which time zone they're located so whether they have internet access or whether the current uh, current class schedule work for them. Do that in a Google form. Yeah, yeah, do that in a Google form. Yeah, that's Much easier question. for them to access. Just, and then you can just send that link in an email or, you know, I would send it in an email through Blackboard actually. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. yeah. And you know what, you bring up a great question. I think that's wonderful that you're asking students what their um, time zones are because for example, um, you know, right now for me, it's 7.43 a.m. And for you all, it's um, 1.43, I think, right? So- Kat is um, bragging because she's in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say where I was. You're the one who said where I was. Um, <laughs> so, but, you know, just being aware of, um, you know, that if time zones will pose issues for students, if you're having synchronous sessions with them or you're expecting them to post things at certain times, just um, be aware that time zones may be an issue. Caitlin, I wanted to, this is Suzette Spencer here. Um, I wanted to bring Mike Bloom in. Um, Mike has been really helpful for me with online tests and the forced completion um, 
uh, option, which I had been using previously, and he alerted me to the fact that that could cause problems. And I just, we didn't raise that here, but I just wanted to share that with everyone um, that I think he's advised me and it, it's worked that forced completion pre presents a problem if there's bandwidth issues yes. with students. So you don't want to choose that option, although it looks really um, attractive and sexy in Blackboard, it's probably not a good thing to do. And we didn't talk about that, but that's just a heads up to everyone who's probably new to creating it. And mm -hmm. it's, it's not really apparent. I had to call him and he knew right away that that was something not to do. And I wanted to do it. And he was like, no, that's not what you want to do. And it has to do with bandwidth. And since we've talked in previous sessions about students um, you know, having different levels of internet access. That's some, that's a heads up that you really want to be aware of. That's not really apparent in Blackboard and it could cause you a lot of headache um, in the actual real time of the exam. Yeah. Thank and, you for that. That's a great, great point. Yeah. And, and just to piggyback on that, I think, you know, um, you know, say a student is, you know, accessing their course materials at Starbucks <laughs> because they're using the internet there and maybe, um, you know, maybe the internet is a bit spotty there and they get knocked off of the internet for whatever reason. Well then, um, you know, if they're taking the exam, what happens to that exam if you've forced completion? Maybe they are, are only halfway through the exam and right. then they don't get to re-enter. So yeah, that's, that's, exactly that's where that, yeah, that's where that becomes a, an issue. So it thank you for bringing huge that up. Headache. Just, don't, just don't choose it. It looks good and it doesn't look like, it doesn't explain what it really does, but I've done it and I've been in error and Mike saved me in real time because he picked up his phone. Um, but it's just not something, just don't choose it. Just really remember that because that will kick students out and they'll be emailing you saying, I got kicked out of my test and I don't know why. And you'll have to literally sit and restart that whole thing with them again. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I would also like to uh, point out that if you have tests that are 50 questions or more, it's always a best practice to present your test one at a time because as a student goes through and they click next, it saves the answer to that question. So if they do get disconnected and you don't have force completion checked, they'll be able to go back into that exam and finish where they left off. Great point. Yeah. Um, Christy, I realize I'm in error because you wanted to say um, something about the email feature. Did you want to mention that now? Yes, I wanted to make everyone aware that when you do send emails out of Blackboard, they do have the do not reply tag and the Amazon web address. So a lot of times that goes to students junk folder or spam folder. In addition to that, those emails cannot be tracked by us or Blackboard. So if you are sending a email out to your entire student um, population, the best thing to do would be to post it as an announcement so they can see it also in your announcements feature in Blackboard. I just wanted to make everybody aware because that has been an issue in the past where some students and some faculty members are saying that they can't see those emails that are being sent and they come in with the do not reply. So definitely check your spam folders. So Paul Manna's question um, on whether the students can go back and change an answer. Only if you check that you, um, there no, the not no backtracking. If you check no backtracking, then they will not be able to go back and change answers. Perfect, thanks. Mm -hmm. And Diane, I don't know if that was enough of an answer for you about options for other than delete attempt rather than just don't force completion, um, but you can always um, give them more time and make sure you don't force completion um, if you're worried about them having uh, enough time to submit it. And I did want to point out too, because uh, Leslie Henderson had asked this question earlier in the chat, and I'm not sure if people saw this, but Blackboard does have um, exceptions where you, if you have students that have um, different exceptions where they need longer on the test, 
that you can set those up within the testing options when you are deploying your test. Right. Yeah, and Blackboard Help has a um, has a um, in, has instruction regarding that as well. How to how to create those accommodations for students. Okay, so um, I think at this point we'll um, end the session. Thank you so much. Remember, um, email us with any questions. Please join the other sessions.